Okay. Where are we at? There we are. Okay. So, we are going to finish 48 Liberal Lies About American History that you probably learned in school tonight. Um, we've got... We'll see. We're on 44, and there are 48 total. And they're all short. So, um, we'll finish it up tonight. And then next Friday, we're going to start in on The Twelfth Planet by Zechariah Sitchin. But, that's next week. Alright, so, jumping right on into it. Lie number 44. Business failures and tax cuts combined to cause the Great Depression. We start off with three quotes again, as usual. The income tax cuts proposed by Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon had increased the volume of money available for speculation. That's by Paul S. Boyer et al., The Enduring Vision. The second one is, like the banks, the investment in industry was fear free from regulation and given to mi misrepresentation, manipulation of stock prices, and inside deals. That is by uh, Gene Boydston et al. Making a Nation. And the third one, Americans have often blamed the stock market collapse for their plight in the 1930s. The blame is not entirely misplaced. The 1920s had been a time of economic growth, but that economic growth depended on an unstable balance of factors. With 50% of the nation's income going to only 20% of its families, the market was limited. And that's by Irvin Unger, Irwin Unger, sorry, these United States. All right. What is most astounding about this myth, despite the fact that most major textbooks continue to propagate it, is that historians almost all accept the premise that big business and the tax cuts of the 20s caused the Great, Great Depression, but almost no economists do. If the incredible volume of economic research on the Great Depression in the last 40 years has proved anything, it is that business was the least important factor in causing the massive downturn and the most damaging participant in the whole affair, government. <gasps> Go figure. The government? They actually messed something up? <gasps> How dare you? One must conclude that most historians will base much of their economic analysis to whatever degree it can be called that, on John Maynard Keynes' General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money, 1936, or on subsequent Keynesian regurgitations such as those of John Kenneth Galbraith, e.g. The Great Crash, 1929-1955. Their general story goes like this. The tax cuts recommended by Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon in the 1920s caused an orgy of speculation in the stock market. That fueled the quote-unquote disparities in wealth that already existed because the evil capitalists were again making money after World War I and thus the ordinary people gambling in the stock market on a way to catch up gambled in the stock market on a, as a way to catch up. By the way, while the dubious claim that 50% of the nation's income went to 20% of the families is a standard statistic used in these narratives, they never seem to note that New Deal income tax policies resulted in, as of 2007, some 60% of all income taxes being paid by only 10% of the taxpayers. Anyway, to continue the accepted narrative, Big banks fed the speculation through their securities affiliates, brokerage houses, which siphoned off depositor dollars to wager on the market. Business interested only in short-term gains ignored the warning signs and continued to erect paper empires such as Samuel Insull's massive electric utility company. But for whatever reason, the historians never seem able to say, the bubble burst, and the stock market crash led to the banking panic. 
we were doomed until Franklin D. Roosevelt arrived in the nick of time to save the nation by punishing business and providing government jobs that restored full employment. Roosevelt, according to those nostrums, was the savior of capitalism. Since virtually all major college textbooks adopt some version of this, I'll spare the reader a five-page footnote. It's all baloney, and economists, who, unlike liberal historians, actually have to prove things, know it. The first substantial challenge to the Keynesian Galbraith model came from Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman and his associate Ann J. Schwartz in their magisterial Monetary History of the United States. They singled out the main culprit of the Depression, the Federal Reserve Board, which was supposedly a private institution, but which acted largely as a government agency, and which in the 1920s was still heavily influenced by administration concerns. From 1929 to 1932, when a crash turned to a recession, then to a depression, the Fed stood by and allowed the money supply to fall by an incredible one-third. They also emphasized the failure of the Fed to stem the tide of bank collapses, particularly the pivotal Bank of the United States in New York, the largest bank in the nation to close up, up to that point. To close up to that point. Once Friedman and Schwartz opened the door, a trickle of criticism of government policies turned into a flood. What about the claim that Americans were speculating out there? Some were, most weren't. Either way, many studies have shown that, one, the bubble effect in the market was either non-existent or minimal. Two, the investments pretty much reflected real values of the companies, both when they went up and when they fell. Three, people were well informed as to what stocks they were buying. Four, those engaging in stock purchases and sales represented a cross-section of Americans. 28% held securities of some type by 1929. And five, the ultimate cause of the crash was, you guessed it, something the government did. Economists, unlike historians, are loath to make absolute statements. Even Eugene White, one of those who has argued for the presence of a bubble, rejects the notion that stock market crashes are the major source of instability. Rather, it is financial policy, which is the responsibility of the Fed. White also argues that while brokers recognized the oncoming crash, investors did not, although Gene Smiley has found evidence to the contrary. Either way, many people, including Charles Merrill, the leading guru of middle-class investors, suspected a correction was in order and warned their investors to pull out long before the crash. As Smiley wrote, quote, In the first half of the 1920s, common stocks appear to have been underpriced, as firms adopted policies that paid stockholders stable dividends, and as corporate profits rose, common stock prices were bid up, anticipated corporate pro profits grew, and investors continued to bid up stock prices. But margin lending alone cannot explain the stock market boom. And, end quote. As to the notion that there was extreme income inequality, it is true that in any and all periods of great economic growth, the rich will proportionately get richer temporarily. This is the nature of risk. The few who survive inevitably reap big benefits. Yet, while there is little evidence that the tax cuts of the 1920s, strongly associated with Treasury Secretary Andrew Mellon, were funneled into the stock market, there is overwhelming evidence that the tax cuts unleashed the roar of American business. The average unemployment rate in the 1920s was under 3.5%, and in 1926, unemployment reached the unheard of low of 1%. Wow. Typically, however, it has been argued that most income gains in the 1920s went to the top 5%. That's Fine reasoning if you only go by wealth gains and ignore the incredible improvements in daily life produced in the 1920s. Real per capita income rose from $522 to $716. Consumers 
share of GNP rose more than 20%, despite the fact that overall prices were falling. Three-fourths of non-farm households acquired electricity. Air travel increased tenfold, and more than 11 million families bought homes by the mid-1920s. By 1928, American homes had 15 million irons, 6.8 million vacuum cleaners, 4.5 million toasters, and 750,000 of the new electric refrigerators. Auto production soared an astonishing 255% during the decade, and radios became a common household item. Electricity, thanks largely to Samuel Insull and his Rockefeller-like obsession with driving down prices, became so inexpensive that most people could electrify their houses and businesses. Electric power production rose by 300% between 1900 and 1929. Make no mistake, this growth occurred primarily because of business, but it was the tax cuts of Andrew Mellon that released the creative energies of American entrepreneurs. The rising tide lifted all boats. When Mellon came in as Secretary of the Treasury, tax rates were shockingly high, having risen from a top rate of 5% in 1913 to a top rate of 75% in 1920. Mellon who firmly believed the rich could pay most of the taxes, discovered that the best way to ensure they did was did so was to cut their tax rates. They would then employ their money, pay more taxes, and in the process, jumpstart the economy. And did they pay taxes? And did they pay taxes? There's an exclamation point there. The share of taxes paid by those with incomes over $500,000 soared with the rich paying almost 50% more than before the tax cut, and the poor paying between 40% and 70% less. Mellon's policies paid off one-third of the national debt in less than a decade. Imagine today with a national debt at over $9 trillion, remember again, this is back in 2007, 8, whatever, we're at what, we're over $30 trillion now. Um, Imagine today with a national debt at over $9 trillion, how a politician would be received who slashed it by a third in less than 10 years. But, this, but they don't want that. <clears throat> but this prosperity began to fade some in late 1928. For one thing, Europe's economies were in trouble, and the world economy was already globalized far more than people understood. One exception, ironically, was Benjamin Strong, head of the New York Federal Reserve Bank, who had attempted to design the Fed's policy in such a way as to encourage Britain and the European nations to recover faster. <clears throat> Another factor that began to work against U.S. economic health was the gold standard, for as nation after nation in Europe left the gold standard, a run on American gold ensued that nearly nearly finished off the reserves of the banks. Perhaps the most important structural weakness was in agriculture, where there were simply too many farmers to maintain profitability. Yet instead of allowing the market to winnow out the unproductive farmers, the government continually sought to artificially prop up prices. Once the farmers began to go under, thousands of farm banks neared bankruptcy. All of this was largely unnoticed in the midst of the phenomenal boom, but would react dangerously to any sudden shock. While no economist can, can convincingly say what triggered the Great Crash, the Smoot-Hawley tariff has been singled out as the most likely candidate. Beginning with Jude Winiski's 1978 book, The Way the World Works, Winiski traced the rises rises and falls of the stock market to news associated with the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which was massive in its pretended effect. Although every imported good would increase under the Almost every imported good would increase under the tariff, and some raw materials would be taxed significantly higher, causing manufacturers to immediately anticipate higher costs and lower sales. This produced instant investment uncertainty and shocked prices. 
the market plunged with each new hurdle in Congress that the tariff crossed. Only recently have economists linked the monetary contraction described by Milton Friedman to the impact of the tariff. With startling results, Douglas Irwin and Mario Crusini and James Kahn found that the Smoot-Hawley tariffs deleterious effect on the economy was equal to 5% of GNP. To put that in perspective, the 9-11 attacks were perhaps 3% of GNP. Katrina, less than 0.5%. Once government policy via Smoot-Hawley had triggered the crash, it only remained for the great engineer, President Herbert Hoover to mess it up worse with tax increases and more government intrusion. For example, after initially cutting taxes mildly, not enough to offset the monetary contraction, Hoover raised taxes. Congress jumped on the bandwagon by passing a check tax, ensuring that commerce would be further stifled. The Fed allowed the money supply to shrink further by failing to rescue banks that were collapsing, and Hoover steadfastly remained on the gold standard. In retrospect, if it seems that a single factor, Smoot-Hawley, might have caused the crash, most economists today agree that remaining on the gold standard was the single most important factor in turning a recession into a depression. As Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke n noted, quote, I do think that the only theory that explains the timing and widespread nature of the Great Depression was to involve monetary and financial issues, which in turn are intimately connected to the gold standard, end quote. Once banks began to fail as a result of losing the gold reserves, Contagion set in, and the ob obsolete American unit bank system could not transmit information or move cash around fast enough to stop the runs. Hoover's solutions, such as the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, made matters worse by publicizing the names of borrower banks. Most of Roosevelt's solutions, in reality, did little. The public hoopla of jobs programs barely dented the unemployment numbers, which still stood at 12.5% in 1939, or 10 times what they had, had been under Coolidge. Again, modern economists are almost unanimous that the New Deal programs hindered recovery. Then the NIRA, according to Bernan Bernan Bernanke, quote, slowed the recovery by reducing the speed with which wages and prices adjusted, end quote. Stephen DeCanio has shown that the minimum wage law slammed the door shut on new hiring by substantially raising the cost of every employee. Hmm, sounds familiar. Suddenly, what was small but steady what was a small but steady rise in employment stopped cold. State bank deposit laws, such as the late Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the later Federal Deposit, usually contributed to bank weakness in the 1930s. Most financial economists agree that the Glass-Steagall Act, which separated investment banking, the securities affiliates, from commercial banking, harmed American banking and made it us less competitive than we could be. Most overlooked by the historians, however, is the fact that the long-term price of New Deal programs has been acknowledged to be steep to the point of bankruptcy, including the portending bailout of Social Security and the complete failure of the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, or what modern Americans know as welfare. While greatly expanded under Lyndon Johnson, this program was started in the 1930s. Social Security is on a trajectory for a massive collapse, with no indication that any president other than George W. Bush had any inclination to fix it. In the 1990s, a Republican Congress finally passed welfare reform, although Bill Clinton vetoed it twice, eliminating the worst parts of AFDC. But as of yet, no one has figured out how to fix the pathology of single parent homes it created from 1965 to 1994. 
Did FDR do anything right? Yes. By taking the United States off the gold standard, he'd saved what was left of the banking system. But as they say, even a blind squirrel finds a nut once in a while. I don't know. There are a whole lot of people that absolutely say we should never have gone off the gold standard, and it's why we're having a lot of the problems we're having now. But I'll let them hash that out with him. All right, so that was lie number 44. Moving on to 45. Uh, yeah, 45, it's about the same length as the one we just read. It is LG, LBJ's Great Society Had a Positive Impact on the Poor. Lie number 45. Um, and this has three quotes to begin with again. Oh, Vesper, hey, how you doing? Welcome. We're reading about, well, I'm just getting ready to start the next lie about history about L LBJ's Great Society. So, glad to have you. Um, feel free to chime in if you have any thoughts on what I'm reading. Okay, so our three quotes. Great Society domestic programs cost only a little more than $6 billion between 1964 and 1967. Many of the programs put in place during the 60s remain pillars in the American welfare state. If Johnson's programs fell short of eliminating poverty in the nation, they nevertheless changed many lives for the better. That's by David E. Harrell, Unto a Good Land. Then the next quote in 1965 and 1966, the 89th Congress, the most productive since the New Deal, adopted such innovations as rent subsidies, demonstration cities, a teacher corps, regional medical centers, and Medicaid to provide medical care for the poor. Lyndon Johnson could take pride in the achievements of the fabulous 89th Congress, which opened up prospects for a new era of reform. That's by Samuel Elliott Morrison et al., A Concise History of the American Republic. Um, oh, one more. I'll read the other one and then I'll make my comment. The Great Society was the most impressive record of domestic legislation in a single session for 30 years. It represented the culmination of New Deal liberalism in its effort to reverse patterns of privation, and inequality in American economic life. That's by John M. Bloom et al., The National Experience. What I was going to say, and you'll it'll become evident here in a minute if you haven't listened in before, he gives these quotes, and then he goes through in his short little article, which this one's like five pages, that he's refuting those claims that are in the quotes. But like I said, it'll be obvious when once we get into it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. In 1965, Lyndon Johnson proclaimed a war on poverty, a never-ending program that could always be extended by simply changing the definitions of poverty. Wow, we see that a lot now too, don't we? Changing definitions. Some of the policies, perhaps all, were well-intended, although... In retrospect, one has to question their function as a vote-getting ploy. Hmm, also sounds familiar. But programs such as food stamps, which were often shunned by poor people who still had a modicum of respect, were advertised and hustled so that eventually a large percentage of those eligible were enrolled. Once a family was dependent on food stamps, the government could dictate their behavior preventing them from using the stamps for such products as alcohol and tobacco, which everyone agreed was bad, but also eventually defining what products constituted food, reducing individual choice still further. Since government was enmeshed in diets, a controversy erupted in the Reagan administration about whether ketchup, which was nutritious but hardly filling, qualified as food. If people go to bed hungry, did it require that they were receiving filling food or nutritious food? 
If the food stamp program revealed some of the difficulties of having the government try to manage individual households' groceries, the aid to family the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, program, showed that the law of unintended consequences is always in effect, and therefore essential institutions such as the family cannot be subject to social engineering. Originally, AFDC was a New Deal program intended to provide support to widows who had children. A century earlier, a community or church might have taken over that role, but after the progressives centralized most charities under state direction for efficiency, quote-unquote, in the late 1800s, many people fell through the cracks. Still, the number of widows with children was relatively small, and thus the program had minimal ill effects. The great society legislators, however, expanded the program to include any woman with children in a household where there was no male present. Gone were the requirement the, the requirements that a woman with children had to have been married and then widowed. Now simply being a female headed household qualified a woman for money for herself and her kids, with a small increase coming for each additional child. In 1950, there were only 651,000 families on AFDC, but by 1970, there were 2.5 million AFDC families, and by 1976, there were 3.5 million families on welfare. Illegitimate births soared 170% for blacks and 353% for whites, although the total number of black illegitimacies was more than six times higher overall than that of whites. Ironically, progress against poverty had been rapid from 1960 to 1968, with the largest drop coming after the John Kennedy tax cut. However, in 1968, when the Great Society programs were coming online, progress against poverty ended, and for several years the United States actually had more poor people. Spending, however, took off like an Atlas booster rocket. Welfare spending per low-income person went from just under $1,000 per person in 1961 to over $8,000 by 1977, with no appreciable change in the poverty levels. Individual states with different welfare policies also found that the 15 highest benefit states had more people on welfare and higher unemployment than the U.S. average and far more than the 15 lowest benefit states. Although by 1980, most people intuitively knew that welfare wasn't working, no book did more to debunk the Great Society welfare programs than Charles Murray's Losing Ground, 1984. Murray's book systematically destroyed the arguments that a slow economy or other factors could have caused the rise in single-parent households and crime. As a statistician, Murray relied on extensive analytical tables, but no statistics proved his point as well as a few simple comparisons of a fictitious couple, Harold and Phyllis. Excuse me. Uh, And how the new welfare laws presented different options to them. Murray explained that with welfare available to Phyllis, there was no incentive for her and Harold to stay married, or if living together, to get married. Financially, married marriage placed a burden on couples because it removed their welfare benefits. By staying unmarried and living together, if Harold had a job, he and Phyllis could earn, quote unquote, almost double what they could from any other living situation. Moreover, Murray was able to explain why blacks were disproportionately hurt by welfare laws. Since the majority lived in urban areas, especially big cities, blacks were easier for government bureaucrats and social workers to identify as poor than were rural whites. AFDC said to any one woman who received it, quote, you don't need a man in the house, you can do better on your own, end quote. Since arguments and disagreements were bound to occur in any relationship, the pressures put on women by AFDC to 
quote-unquote kick the bum out, proved irresistible. Soon, illegitimacy rates began to skyrocket to the point that by the early 1990s, some two-thirds of all inner-city black children had no father in the home. One study estimated that half of the increase in out-of-wedlock births among black women was directly attributable to additional welfare benefits. Worse, without male role models to identify with, young black males gravitated to the strong male leaders in gangs, which then dragged them into a life of crime. Crime by youths under 18 more than doubled between 1960 and 1976. These trends were only accelerated by revisions in divorce laws that introduced no-fault divorce. States began changing their laws in the 1970s, at which time usually a full court hearing and some proof of cause was required. To require a simple statement that the parties had, quote, irre irreconcilable differences, end quote, the number of children living in one parent, mostly single mother, families rose in the 1970s from 11% to 19%. By the 1980s, uh, quote, only 50% of children could expect to spend their entire childhood in an intact family, end quote. This was well, no, well down from the 80% of children who grew up in a family of two biological parents in the years after World War II. Certainly no-fault divorce played a part. Divorce rates, which stood at 10%, 10, or 10 per, sorry, 10 per, 1,000 in the early 1960s increased sharply to 23 per 1,000 marriages by 1979, surpassing deaths as a leading cause of family breakup in 1974. Despite an assault on the nuclear family by leftists, evidence began to surface showing that single-parent households were damaging children, culminating with the comment by Vice President Dan Quayle in 1992 about the television show Murphy Brown, which had celebrated the heroine's decision to pursue motherhood without a husband or father present. Quayle said, quote, it doesn't help matters when primetime TV has Murphy Brown, a character who supposedly epitomizes today's intelligent, high-paid professional woman, mocking the importance of fathers by bearing a child alone and calling it just another lifestyle choice, end quote. Quayle was ridiculed for his stand. I never thought I'd hear another, uh, a quote from Dan Quayle other than the, the uh, um, thing about him convincing the kid in the spelling bee to misspell potato. <laughs> um, within a few years, however, it is, had become obvious that, in fact, children were being damaged by family breakup and that creating a generation of fatherless boys was not in the best interests of either the children or the nation. Barbara Defoe Whitehead summarized the sociological literature in 1993 in an article called Dan Quayle Was Right. The social research showed that children from out-of-wedlock or divorced families did worse on almost all measures of well-being. They were more likely to experience poverty, to drop out of high school or get pregnant, to abuse drugs, and to be in trouble with the law. Moreover, children from disrupted families were more likely to suffer from physical or sexual abuse. Those children also had a harder time staying in their own marriages and even holding regular jobs. Yeah, he did pretty much fade into obscurity. I haven't heard anything about him in, God, decades now. By the 1990s, even as Quayle made his comments and faced ridicule, policymakers were reaching a grim consensus that the great society programs had been wrong and that welfare had not worked. It had driven people away from work and into dependency, and it had destroyed families. In 1994, Republicans won both houses of Congress and be began crafting a Welfare Reform Act that limited welfare payments to two years and placed a cap on the total number of years that one could qualify. 
Although President Bill Clinton vetoed this legislation twice after consulting the polls, he finally signed it, then took credit for it. Despite the dire predictions of the Great Society liberals, Great Society liberals, most of those who were pushed off welfare found employment. Contrary to predictions that abortion rates would sharply rise, they slightly fell. A part of the damage done by the Great Society had been undone, but what was not undone was the condition of the marriageless ghetto in which the overwhelming majority of black women raised families without a husband present. That perpetuated the pathology of young black males associating with gangs and rejecting traditional routes to economic success. You know, he does have a point there. A whole lot easier to stand on the corner and do drug deal drugs than it is to hold down a full-time job. At least some people think so anyway. I wouldn't want to do it. But the sad fact is no government program has done more to destroy the black family than the great society expansion of aid to families and depend with de Ugh. Okay, expansion of aid to families with dependent children, AFDC. Black economist Walter E. Williams is famous for saying that if he were the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan, he could think of no more destructive program to African Americans than public education. I beg to differ. Some, if not most, of the effects of public education can be overcome with time. The pathologies put in place by the AFDC overwhelmingly resulted in black teens being either pregnant or dead. There was no time for them to recover from the program's ill effects. By 1990, 57% of all black births were out of wedlock. I think it's even higher than that now. It's like 70-something. The result of welfare reform started coming in a few years later, and while the detrimental effects of welfare were obvious from the results, it was not as clear what else was needed, besides ending welfare, for single mothers to succeed. For example, a Wisconsin study found that the number of women using AFDC plummeted from 96,300 in 1990 to just over 5,000 in 1998. The study also reported that, quote, one out of four women who were on AFDC in 1990 were clearly self-supporting eight years later, end quote. Working full-time was necessary, however, to emerge from poverty. Quote, to be successful, you simply had to work four quarters a year, end quote. Attitudes toward work, interpersonal skills, and ability to take instruction were also important. Nationally, 42% of black children were living in poverty before wel welfare reform. Seven years later, after welfare reform, nearly 32% were still in poverty. Similarly, the number of children living in hunger has plummeted since 1992, while the number of families on AFDC was cut by half. But AFDC's damage was long-lasting in other ways, especially the demise of the male-headed family. As Wade Horn and Andrew Bush showed in Father's Marriage and the Next Phase of Welfare Reform, the next step in welfare reform had to be a return to strengthening marriages and especially to getting fathers once again involved in raising their children. In an era when liberals have pushed for normalizing non-traditional families, that next step will be a big one. And that's the end of that article. <laughs> He calls them liberal lies about American history. They're not always liberal in my mind, but anyway, <laughs> they're interesting. All right. If nobody has anything to comment on that one, I'm going to jump right on into number 46, which is the decline of American Autos and steel was caused by insufficient government support for the industries. That's the lie. Um, since we, in you know, recent memory, bailed out all the big car manufacturers, I'd say that they've had plenty of support, and they shouldn't have been bailed out. That 
too big to fail crap is just got to, it's got to go, man. <laughs> uh, anyway, jumping into it, we only have two quotes to begin this one. The practical choice is not between government intervention and non-intervention. Rather, industrial policies are necessary to ease society's adjustment to structural changes. Government industrial policies are also appropriate when the public return on investment is likely to exceed private return. That's by Ira C. Magaziner and Robert B. Reich, Minding America's Business. And the second one. American businesses in the 1980s and 1990s embarked on a rigorous downsizing that resulted in the firing of many skilled and loyal workers. That's by David E. Harrell et al. Unto a Good Land. Okay. And this one, well, I guess it's, it's, why did I think these were all short? This is, these have all been pretty much the standard, about five pages. <clears throat> anyway, moving on. How did the U.S. auto industry, which once outproduced and outsold all major foreign competitors by a factor of four, fall in such hard times? Why did American Steel, not only the world leader for decades, but the standard bearer for quality, nearly collapse in the 1970s and 1980s before staging a recovery? If you listen to liberals such as Ira Magaziner, Magaziner, I don't know how to pronounce that. It's like magazine with an R on the end. <laughs> um, if you listen to liberals such as Ira Magaziner, Mag Magaziner, or Robert Reich, you would have to conclude it was due to government failure. The unwillingness of mostly Republican presidents to support Detroit through tariffs or import quotas. Or the inability of those same leaders to force the Japanese into restricting their superior quality exports. Magaziner, I'll try that one, and Reich, for example, contend that, quote, a minimalist role for government might be appropriate in an economy that was sheltered from international competition, end quote, but obviously not for the modern U.S. economy. A spate of books with titles such as The Deindustrialization of America and Manufacturing Matters, the Myth of the Post-Industrial Economy, heralded a service economy that could no longer compare with the Japanese because compete with the Japanese, sorry, compete with the Japanese because of insufficient government intervention. In fact, the only role government played in damaging either industry came through environmental regulations, workplace laws that restricted productivity, and pro-union policies that kept American wages at ridiculously high levels for almost 20 years. But don't get the idea that Detroit's auto executives and the, auto, the United Auto Workers didn't make things much worse. They did. The resulting combination of bad government, bad management, and poor labor policies knocked the world leader in both autos and steel off its pedestal, possibly permanently. Detroit's problems did not begin in Washington, but a century earlier in the boardrooms of the Pennsylvania Railroad and DuPont Chemical, where a new business organization called the Managerial Hierarchy became entrenched. This form of management resulted from large numbers of stockholders, the owners, needing permanent managers who could operate the company. Hence the arrival of the professional managers who were presidents or chief operating officers. Among its many advantages, the managerial hierarchy brought with it a division of management units in which every unit supervised a single special area of operations sales, legal, research, and development, and other units appeared, but by far the most important, although it came under several names, was the finance division. Finance oversaw the raising of capital for future acquisitions and also imposed budgets on the companies. Within 75 years, though, the finance men or numbers men dominated most major U.S. corporations. 
and with their total control of the statistics, they were almost impossible to, to defeat in boardroom debates. Production men, or those who had experience in actually making products and building things, were ignored, only because they couldn't make a stronger case with the statistics. Several classic examples of how disastrous this was for Detroit are found in David Halberstam's The Reckoning, where plant managers saddled with excess bumpers or starters would simply dump them in a local river rather than risk the wrath of their superiors in Detroit who knew, quote-unquote, how many bumpers or starters they needed. Halbertstam called the, this the screw Detroit game. In, other ca in another case, Ford's, number, Ford's numbers men, led by future Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, were told by the production men they needed new, larger paint ovens to accommodate the bigger Ford trucks. Instead, the numbers men suggested painting the trucks in two stages in a single oven, a process that any car owner knew would result in a two-toned truck. Car designs failed to keep pace with the technology or consumer demand. Small pony cars such as the Ford Mustang or the Chevy Chevrolet Camaro kept growing and growing so that after five years they had become the size of a typical 1960s era family car. Even the famous two-seat Thunderbird was remade into a large touring luxury sedan. It's not that, Detro that Detroit didn't have the technology. Racing teams had used fuel injectors, blowers, overhead camshafts, electronic ignition, and dozens of other performance and safety technologies for almost a decade. But the big three, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler, seemed content to make the, the auto chassis longer, add more chrome, or change the upholstery inside. Then came the twin blows of the environmental movement and the consumer movement, highlighted by Ralph Nader's Unsafe at Any Speed in 1964 and passage of the National Traffic Motor Vehicle Safety Act of 1966. The evidence on the benefits of auto safety regula regulations is not at all obvious. A 1991 Center for Disease Control report showed that while the use of auto safety seats for children had risen for eight years, child fatalities had not decreased. Nor was the seatbelt regulation pushed by Nader even proven as successful as is widely believed. Hawaii, which had the most rigorously enforced seatbelt law and the highest compliance in the nation, quote, has experienced an increase in traffic fatalities and fatality rates since its law went into effect in December 1985, end quote. Sam Peltzman's famous 1975 study showed that the safer cars were, were made, the more likely drivers were to take risks. Researchers comparing like models of automobiles with and without airbags discovered that personal injury claims rose significantly in those with airbags. In the early 1970s, both the consumer safety and environmental movements had gained their own Kremlin-sized bureaucracies inside the U.S. government, and both bureaucracies had begun churning out rules and regulations to protect the environment and the consumer. House and Senate staffs expanded by 55, 55% in the 1970s, and the total staff supporting all of Congress grew 68%. The Federal Register of Laws grew to 424 percent in the decade of the 1960s. The number of lawyers increased by 52 percent, and civil cases rose 134 percent. Okay, well, yeah, and that effect is even worse today with these cars with 10 different traction profiles, 20 airbags, and self-driving. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and and. And now, I mean, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but people are also sue happy, which is why they've got to have a warning label on everything. I mean, there's the meme going around. You don't have to put a, a warning label that a bag of nuts might contain nuts. I already know. If it didn't, I'd be pretty pissed off. 
people are fucking maniacs on the road now, worse than mad. Yeah, absolutely, because uh, things are so safe. They don't. They, that's why they're they they have no problem sitting there playing with their stupid phone while they drive. Um, because they think they're totally safe. The airbags will save them. Plus, people are just idiots. <laughs> Some of these regulations were necessary and beneficial. Most were not. Forced to eliminate lead gasoline, the auto industry introduced the catalytic converter, which reduced gas mileage. Yes, it did. When bureaucrats demanded better gas mileage, car makers replaced metal parts with plastic, hurting the metal industry and making cars less safe. Outright poor designs did not help Detroit's case, and jokes about exploding pintos became standard late-night fare for comedians. <laughs> Clean air regulations, as embodied in the 1965 Motor Vehicle Air Pollution Act, came at an extraordinarily high price, one that has generally been hidden from the American public by environmentalists. Yeah, actually, I have my own kind of anecdotal evidence on that one. You look at a brand new car today and you look at my parents Buick from the mid 90s early 90s whatever I don't remember exactly what year it is the Buick got like 35 miles to the gallon and the ones now are bragging it up when they get 16 so if the Buick puts out twice as much emissions as the new car, but goes even further per one gallon than they can go on two, isn't it the cleaner one? Just my own observation. Okay. I left off in the middle of a paragraph. Here we go. One study said... The, the act reduced the gross domestic product by 2.6%, or $150 billion in 1970 dollars. Another put the damage done to the economy at a much higher level, about $300 billion, or, quote, about half the combined federal, state, and local expenditures on education, end quote. Few contemplated that the burden of the 1965 Act alone was equal to the entire weight that the British Navigation Acts placed on the colonists, resulting in a revolution. The hidden nature of the law's impact magnified by the constant evolution and expansion of original laws placed a massive drag on American productivity. In 1975 alone, for example, some 177 New rules appeared, oh, sorry, this is a quote. Quote, new rules appeared, as did 2,865 proposed amendments to existing rules, 309 final rules, and 7,305 final rule amendments, end quote, for a total of over 10,600 new rules, proposed rules, and amendments. People? Yes. One study published in the prestigious Yale Journal on Regulation looked at 445 manufacturing industries between 1974 and 1986, finding, quote, regulation diverts economic resources and managerial attention away from the productivity enhancing innovation, end quote. Another multi-state study concluded that from 1972 to 1987, the Clean Air Act alone cost $112 billion and 590,000 lost jobs. It is entirely likely that no studies to date have even begun to measure the damage in job losses and diverted investment of the national environmental and health regulations. Foreign countries such as Japan, which did not operate until such onerous re uh, blah, 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 sorry, let me start that again. Foreign countries such as Japan, which did not operate under such onerous 
regulations were far more productive and soon took the lead in steel and autos. By 1980, Japan produced 11 million automobiles, many shipped to American shores. It represented a stunning achievement for a nation that had only had that it only made half a million vehicles in 1960, when Detroit claimed nearly 80% of the world market. Unions and auto industry lobbyists whined about unfair competition and sought government protection, either in the form of import tariffs or by exercising influence to persuade the Japanese to impose their own export quotas. Likewise, American Steel, witnessing spiral spiraling wage costs and regulatory burdens pleaded for help from the government. In 1968, the U.S. government obliged with the voluntary restraint agreements to reduce steel imports, but rather than restructuring to become competitive, the industry started to rely on such protection. In reality, Japanese companies were obtaining their advantage through labor costs that were only 70% of those in the United States. Unions played a key role in the decline of American steel. When American unionized workers made $20 an hour in the early 1980s, their Japanese counterparts earned $3. Mainly, however, environmental concerns and regulations prohibited U.S. steelmakers from opening new, more competitive facilities. Except for Bethlehem Steel, the only truly new facilities built in the 1970s came from the new radical mini-mills, such as arc-melting facilities used by Nucor. Japanese assets in steel rose 23% between 1966 and 1972, whereas U.S. plant and, <clears throat> and equipment only rose 4%. Excuse me. Might have to go refill my water here in a minute. In just over a decade, from 1974 to 1986, American steel companies shed 337,000 jobs, and the industry eliminated 30% of its steelmaking capacity. Before it was over, 75% of all U.S. steel workers had lost their jobs. Steel finally turned the corner in 1987, with the American productivity eclipsing that of the Japanese. For the most part, the U.S. government had not intervened, a fact that allowed the steelmakers to get competitive and remain in business. While the, Uni U While the United States still trailed Japan in true total steel output by 1993, Americans had built their share of the world total back to 11%. Companies such as Nucor, with no government assistance, reached world highs in productivity per ton of steel. Likewise, American auto manufacturers staged something of a comeback in the late 1980s, with GM slashing almost two-thirds of its payroll. And the Japanese? Their government-directed miracle be began to come apart at the seams in the 1990s. The Ministry of International Trade and Industry, MITI, suddenly looked less than spectacular with its industry picks. Beginning in 1992, Japan entered a period of severe stagnation, with growth sagging back to pre-miracle levels of 1% per year. After a decade's worth of praise for Japanese-style management, studies showed that the hype was premature. Japan's high-tech industrial policies and intervention produced neither exceptionally high levels of cooperation nor widespread success. Indeed, as George Gilder pointed out, in all of the areas in which Japan took the lead from the United States, it developed more competitors, not fewer. And one of the largest automakers in the world, Honda, had no government support. Quite the contrary, Honda was told by the Japanese government and MITI to stay out of automaking. It became abundantly clear by the end of the 1990s that American policymakers were correct to let the nation's heavy industry sink or swim in global competition without bailouts, subsidies, or protection. And that's the end of number 46. So we've got two more to go. 40, it is 48 liberal lies, so we've got, we're on 47. But I'm going to go refill my water glass real quick. It'll only take just 
less than a minute. So um, I will be right back, I promise. So, our last two. Woohoo! I've I've kind of enjoyed the book. The guy pisses me off in some of his articles. I don't agree with him, and he uses too many quotes sometimes. But otherwise, for the most part, I've I've enjoyed this book. But I am ready to move on to the next one, which is Zechariah Sitchin, the Twelfth Planet. Um, so that'll be for next Friday. But. <clears throat> All right, our lie number 47. The Reagan tax cuts caused massive deficits and the national debt. Interesting to see what he has to say about this one. So we have two quotes to start off with. Few doubted that the supply-side formula intensified an ominous fiscal crisis. The national debt grew from $907 billion in 1980 to over $2 trillion in 1986. That's by John Mack. Farragher at all out of many. Excuse me. The second quote is the Reagan tax cuts resulted in slashing rates for the rich, cutting the government's total income by seven hundred and forty seven billion over five years. The tax cuts meant less money for federal programs. And that's by David Goldfield et al. The American Journey. And, um, oh, we've got a couple of charts for this one. Woohoo! There's only been like two pictures in the whole book, and then we've got two charts for this one. So that'll be interesting. Okay. The wanton disregard of facts when it comes to Reaganomics constitutes what I call the pregnancy test for bias in college textbooks. If you want to a quick answer on whether a textbook is biased, flip to the index under Reagan and read that section. Usually one will quickly find comments such as this, such as this, quote, it was hard to connect to so likable a man to the mean spirited programs with which he was off was too often associated, end quote. Or making it appear that the tax cuts caused the stock market's temporary Re-entrench, retrenchment of 1987, George Tyndall and David Shee wrote darkly that, quote, on October 19th, 1987, the bill collector suddenly arrived on the nation's doorstep, end quote. Of course, with their great training in economics, they concluded this was attributable to, quote, the nation's spiraling 
indebtedness, and chronically high trade deficits, end quote. If he keeps putting these quotes this close together, I'm going to start getting pissed at him again. I hate it when people rely on quotes to write something. Write it yourself or don't write it at all. <sighs> if any of these historians had ever bothered to consult the most rudimentary facts, such as the government's own tax renewable rev tax revenue tables, rather than repeat the talking points of the Democratic National Committee, they might have achieved some level of accuracy. According to the U.S. Census data in 1981, Reagan's first full year in office, federal receipts were $600 billion, and Reagan actually had shrunk the budget by $5 billion from the last Carter budget. In 1989, which was Reagan's last full budget, receipts had shot up to $909 billion. More important, rece receipts from income taxes after the tax cuts rose from $122 billion in 1980 to $393 billion, or an increase of more than 200%. Corporate income tax revenue soared from $64 billion to $160, sorry, $106 billion, almost doubling. Keep in mind that this incredible growth was occurring while inflation was being squeezed out of the economy, a stunning accomplishment. There is simply no way any honest analyst can look at the stark reality of these figures and conclude that tax cuts caused the deficit. In, in, in any way, shape, or form. It is absolutely true, however, that deficits did rise under Reagan and that the national debt also rose. Overall spending rose from $579 billion under Jimmy Carter to $1.05 trillion by 1989. The culprit? Liberals tried to blame defense spending and in their two-volume textbook, Tyndall and Xi state, quote, Reaganomics departed from the Coolidge record, which, incidentally, the authors did not particularly care for, mainly in the mounting deficits and in their major cause growing expenditures for the armed forces, end quote. But military spending rose only slightly during the decade, from 22% of the U.S. budget in 1980 to 27% in 1989 or an increase of under 1% of GNP. Food assistance was barely touched as were income security programs, although naturally, if employment was surging as it was, such programs were used far less. But spending on housing and housing assistance rose, as did health care services and social security increased, as did aid to agriculture, science, and recreational sources, resources. Even the least curious person would notice these sound a lot like pork bar barrel projects, as indeed they were. They caused the def What caused the deficits? The Democratic Congress with its pork barrel spending. Democrats are notorious for their pork barrel spending. I mean, that's, that is true. Critics claimed Reagan, quote, could, could have vetoed these budgets, end quote, but not without damaging the critical defense overlays, outlays, that were directly responsible for winning the Cold War. The plain facts are that Reagan's tax cuts worked, combined with the actions of Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker to hold down inflation, the tax cuts generated the most remarkable boom in American history. Even Daniel Jurgen, no fan of the Gipper, noted that the economic boom of the Clinton years, quote, actually began in the Bush administration, end quote. In fact, however, both the Bush and Clinton surges continued to spring from the original Reagan tax cuts which by 2007 had generated nearly 24 million new, net new jobs, whereas most of Europe, including low-tax Ireland, actually lost jobs. Liberals' deep-seated antipathy to the tax cuts, regardless of the phenomenal record of growth, stems from their approach to taxation. 
realize that, as mentioned earlier, the Reagan tax cuts actually increased government revenues, as did the Andrew Mellon cuts in the 1920s and the John Kennedy cuts of the 1960s, as well as the George W. Bush cuts of the early 2000s. If the government is receiving more money, what can the liberals complain about? The answer is that while more overall money is coming into government with lower tax rates, the politicians' control over individuals via income taxes is diminished. As, as explained in lie number 43, even the original income tax was not primarily justified on the grounds that government needed more money, but rather that it was simpler than the constant intricate tariff revisions and was a means to quote unquote soak the rich. Because of the deep seated hostility to tax cuts, most textbooks go out of their way to demonize the incredibly successful Reagan cuts, and the only possible issue they can use for this purpose is the deficit. As shown, the deficit was entirely the product of congressional pork barrel spending, yet textbooks. And I would actually put it more that way. He put it as liberal or Democrat, Democrat pork barrel spending. I think they all pork barrel. They're, they're, they're all terrible about it. Both sides. I don't care. Uniparty, whatever you want to call them nowadays. Uh, Yet textbooks not only misinform by not mentioning that it was Congress, not the president, that caused the deficits, but in my view, they deliberately distort the actual data. No example is more egregious than that of the American pageant by Thomas A. Bailey et al., long one of the best-selling U.S. history texts on the market. The American pageant, in its ninth and 10th editions, featured budget deficit and national debt charts that at face value suggest Reagan had completely lost control of government spending. The federal budget chart shows that the deficit exploded from $73.8 billion in 1980 to $212.3 billion in 1985. Something is wrong with the picture, however. The caption at the top of the chart says billions of dollars. See the chart in American pageant, the federal budget, 1930-1988. An economist, is that one of the charts he put in here? Nope. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe it is. Hold on. Hold on. Well, we'll get to it when we get to it, I guess. He's got a whole big long paragraph in, in between the two charts he he um he put he uh included so i'll read that when i get there all right uh, where are we billions of dollars okay an economist economist would immediately note that it would should read billions of real dollars and that the numbers have not been adjusted for inflation moreover given that the economy was soaring under reagan the nation in essence made more money what a person person or nation owes is certainly related to what it earns, which in the case of a country is the GNP. When the numbers used by Bailey and Kennedy for the budget deficits are recalculated in real dollars as a share of GNP, the chart bears no resemblance to the one in the textbook. Reagan's deficits, while higher than normal, were about where Carter's were when he first took office, and several orders of magnitude less than those of Franklin Roosevelt during World War II. Normally, one would never notice such an error were it not so egregiously compounded by a second chart in the same chapter of the same book. In that chart, the national debt, 1930 to 1990, the dates have been changed from 1988, perhaps because the deficits began to increase, decrease in 1989 and 90, making the visual image of the first figure less compelling. Second, the national jet debt chart has headers superimposed on the chart line in case a student is so thick as to miss its slanted message. Of the six headers, five are, ev are events. Only one is a person, Reagan. It reminds one of the Sesame Street game 
one of these things is not like the other. Oh, it's actually a quote here. One of these things is not like the other things. One of these things just doesn't belong, end quote. A young viewer will be shown three parakeets and a musk ox, with one hopes the appropriate response being that the parakeets are alike. The American pageant wants to make clear that the line that skyrockets upward after 1980 belongs to Reagan. See the national debt 1930 to 1990 at the top of page 237, which is um, the charts I'm going to get to here in just a second. It's the next page. Once again, however, the attentive reader will notice that the data are neither in real dollars nor stated as a share of GNP, which makes all the difference in the world. It does not even seem to be the same chart as the one below it, which I created to reflect the debt in real dollars. Debt as a chair of GNP, 1930 to 1990. The stark visual picture of the bias presented by the two charts is apparent when they are viewed together. Okay. So I'm going to read the caption he has between the two charts, and then I'll show the two charts to you. Um, in an attempt to portray the Reagan economy as anything but outstanding, textbooks have distorted coverage to emphasize rising deficits and the national debt. But even then, they have skewed reality. The chart above from the American pageant depicts the national debt but doesn't bother to adjust it for real dollars, giving the impression that the national debt was the worst in the nation's history. It was not, as seen in my own recalculations of the debt numbers in the chart below, which were adjusted for inflation and placed as a share of the GNP. In fact, debt levels under Ronald Reagan were lower than those of the Eisenhower or Truman administrations and were tiny compared to those of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Note also the American pageant chart features time bars to help the student, but that every time bar reflects an event except for the last one, for Reagan, which identifies a person, just so the students will properly demonize Reagan. Okay, and here we are. Here, So here is the one out of the American pageant, the one he's talking about with the time bars. We'll see if we can get that. Ooh, i got to take my glasses off to be able to do this. All right, so there is the one he's talking about. I don't know if you can read all those. I can't read them myself right now. But you've got the years on the bottom and the billions of dollars along the side. That's the one out of American Pageant. And then this is his readjusted for real dollars one. And percentage of GNP. Oh, I hope you can see that well enough. Um, and then we're almost done with this. Um, it's one thing for text to slant the language, quote, Reagan was the candidate of the rich, end quote, or the coverage giving twice as much space to the Iran-Contra scandal as to the soaring economy under Reagan or his defeat of the Soviet Union, but it's an entirely different matter to manipulate data to present a, bi a biased, if not false, picture of the past. And that is the end of the 47th lie. Woo! All right. Wow, we have seven people watching. That's unusual for me. Thank you all for being here. All right, we're on to the last one. And it is... Just over three pages, and then we're totally done with this book. All right, so it is, unless somebody has something to add. Yep, last one. How could anyone hate Reagan, love or hate his policies? He had charisma. They do, even the people who hate his hated his policies, or think they hated his policies, say he was like, one of the most charismatic and likable presidents we've ever had. So there's that. <laughs> hey, Nambro. He was, he was, he was a, 
And I don't know what he was like when he was uh, governor of California. I've never uh, looked into that. The, be the best presidents are, are great actors. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> or the best politicians? <laughs> Probably. They're all actors to some extent, that's for sure. All right, so here we go. Our last one. Final three pages. History textbooks used in schools are unbiased and not politically correct. <laughs> Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. I remember that speech. I remember watching it in school. I mean, live. Like, well, maybe not live, but, you know, when it was happening. All right. It should be evident in these pages from the extensive examples taken from American history textbooks that students get a distinctly slanted view of American history, one that portrays the United States as oppressive, imperialistic, and evil. The slant louds socialistic efforts at wealth redistribution, criticizes American military success, and laments the punishment of anti-American traitors. But there is one last perspective on this issue. In the introduction, a number of ways bias can be inserted into textbooks were reviewed, which, player, which players get treatment, how much, what emphasis do the subjects get. As noted in the introdu introduction, one means of measuring this is in the pictures. The images of the Ku Klux Klan are more frequently used to portray 20th century America than, say, the moon landing, John F. Kennedy, D Ronald Reagan, or even the civil rights marches. A picture is worth a thousand words, but words, too, are important. A word count of a number of topic, topics in these American history textbooks, which I have conducted, is revealing. My methodology is somewhat subjective. Whether words counted towards the individual is, is not usually, or, or, sorry, whether words counted towards the individual or not usually was determined by headings and subheadings. Whether the topic still included the person or concept in question, for example. Naturally, someone else might perform a word count on these same texts and come away with slightly different numbers, but only slightly. I have used all of the text referenced throughout this book, but not Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, nor James W. Lowen's Lies My Teacher Told Me, as they do not pretend to be textbooks in the traditional sense of the word. Likewise, my choice of people, topics, or concepts was subjective. I chose events or people who could be easily identified and would have minimal bleed over into other sections of the book, as opposed, for example, to Franklin Roosevelt or Thomas Jefferson, who could conceivably come up in many chapters, or the Constitution for the same reason. I compared, for example, coverage of the Watergate scandal, in which Richard Nixon was not formally impeached but did resign, to the Clinton impeachment, in America, a narrative history, Watergate got 1,125 words, Clinton's impeachment, 794. These United States similarly gave Watergate about 600 more words of coverage than it did the Clinton impeachment, while in Give Me Liberty and Nation of Nations, the ratio was nearly 2 to 1. American Destiny had a 3 to 1 ratio of Watergate to Clinton impeachment coverage. Only two of the major texts gave Clinton's impeachment more attention than Watergate, out of many and unto a good land. While one could draw a number of conclusions about this, the obvious message is that Nixon's deeds were far worse than Clinton's. Yet Clinton was punished with only the second impeachment in American history, while Nixon resigned on his own volition, certainly under great pressure. Critics might contend that a fairer comparison would be the Clinton impeachment and the impeachment of Andrew Johnson, the first impeachment of an American president. Give Me Liberty dictates twice as, uh, sorry, dedicates twice as many words to the Clinton trial as it does to Andrew Johnson's American Journey almost four times as many words. 
Only two of the books dedicate more space to Johnson, America and Narrative History and Making a Nation, in each case only a hundred or so. But Unto a Good Land has almost 1,450 words on Clinton's troubles versus 477 for Johnson. I would actually have to say that that might be just because that's all there is. You know, there might not be much of a record of it or as much of a record of it because it wasn't on TV (laughs) or radio. But anyway, moving on. Qualitative analysis would require more than simple word counts, but having read all these books, I can assure the reader that the treatments of Bill Clinton are overwhelmingly sympathetic, while the tone taken with Andrew Johnson ranges from objective to scornful. What about famous people and politically correct inclusion of women and minorities? No one would argue that Martin Luther King or Booker T. Washington do not deserve extensive coverage, but W.E.B. Du Bois? In these United States, he gets more words than presidential candidate and U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater. Give Me Liberty dedicates 25% more words to Du Bois than Goldwater. Out of many, twice as much, and American Destiny gives Du Bois over 1,000 words, but Goldwater only 116. Indeed, in Unto a Good Land, Dubois and Robert E. Lee get almost identical word counts, while in Making a Nation, Dubois gets twice as much ink as Lee. Jane Addams gets what appears to be what appears to be appropriate and proportional treatment between 100 and 300 words in most books, although Unto a Good Land seemed particularly Adams obsessed, providing her with almost three full pages. Finally, the aforementioned Ku Klux, Ku Klux Klan appear to be on every historian's mind. Every book dedicates at least a page on average to the Klan just in the 1920s, not counting more reason, reasonable coverage that fits appropriately in the Reconstruction papers, chapters. And to repeat, almost every textbook adds to the 1920s coverage of the Klan by featuring at least one photo and usually an extensive accompanying caption. Mere snippets such as these suggest a seriously flawed, dark, and sinister view of the United States is held by most of those who today write her history. The villains of 20th century America are Richard Nixon and William Jennings Bryan, portrayed as a crook and a buffoon, respectively. The image of our nation is the Klan robe and the handcuffed Rosenbergs, or Seiko and Vanzetti, not the heroes of Iwo Jima, the firefighters of 9-11, or Billy Graham. When modern textbooks don't slant through coverage, they often mislead by dis- descriptions. Reagan as the candidate of the rich, Roosevelt as the man of the people, Alger Hiss as innocent. Accounts of American military heroism are often missing entirely. Zinn doesn't even bother covering Civil War battles. After all, they didn't matter. Only the draft riots were truly symbolic of the conflict. If these are the the distortions we can spot easily, however, how much more difficult is it to point out to students the utter absence of debates about federalism and the scope of the federal government's power in the 20th century? How much additional research should teachers have to do to present material about America's religious heritage and its continued thriving presence after World War II? Where are the explanations about equality of opportunities differing substantially from opportunities of of outcome? And when are serious questions about the environment or public health balanced with solid and sympathetic information about the damage done to constitutional liberties and personal rights? Finding bias in these books is the easy part, but it's only the beginning. For future generations to recognize that they live in the most blessed nation on earth, they need to have an accurate and honest record of America's past, always tempered with the understanding that because we remain a shining city on a hill, 
the inquiry into the past should always be balanced with an appreciation for the liberties that that past has provided. The end. Woo! We finished it. And all of this is just notes and bibliography. So that is that. It was a, overall a good book. Glad I read it. Glad I did it on stream. But I'm definitely ready to move on to the next one. Which, like I said before, is going to be The Twelfth Planet by Zechariah Sitchin. So that'll be that. Um, I don't know. Do I have a... Let me see if I've got a... If I can even show you. A picture of that um, book. I don't generally show the books as I read them, except for pictures. Um, but I think I've got one. If I can get it to come up on my screen. We'll see if I can do this. Um... Nope, it's not going to do it. Oh, well, it's easy enough to look up. Look up the 12th planet. It's, it's, like I said, it's, it's an easy one to find. Um, and that'll be what we start next week. I don't have it in hard copy. I've only got it in uh, electronic copy, but eh, it works. Um, a lot of the books I have are electronic nowadays. So... Need Thomas Sowell? Yes, I need to figure out um, one of his books I want to read. So if anybody has a Thomas Sowell book suggestion, um, definitely uh, let me know. I And I will, if I don't have it, I'll find it. Um, let's see. Now I'm curious. I got to look. I have to look. I have... a lot of, of, I mean, I have tens of thousands of books to, so let me see what I've got. Okay. So these are the books I have by Thomas Sowell. I have a personal odyssey, barbarians inside the gates, basic economics, uh, Thomas Sowell, the reader, Marxism, um, Maverick, a biography of Thomas Sowell. Economic facts and fallacies. Affirmative action around the world. A conflict of visions. And civil rights rhetoric or reality. So quite a few. <laughs> so, um, you know, look look up a book you want to want me to read by Thomas Sowell. And uh, if I've got it or if I can find it online. Um, I will get it and read it. So you know what would be a good book to read? What? What would that be, Retro? Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. Okay. All right. Let me see. It's possible I even have it. Ooh, ooh, wait. You gotta actually write the wealth of nations. Let's see. It's possible. It's thinking about it. I should have just used. I was just using the Windows search. I should have used a better one than that. But. We'll see if I've got it. Um, that would be a good one, too. I've also had several people, um, not recently, but I've had people request um, um, Holographic Universe. 
I've had several people request. Looks like I do not have Wealth of Nations, so I will be looking for it. Um, I will find it, and I will get it uh, on the stream. Let's see. What am I looking for? There's another place I didn't look. I've got two two sections of books here on my computer, so. But anyway, while it's searching, um, I've I haven't I haven't raided anybody in a couple of days, but there just doesn't seem to be anybody on that. Uh, I mean, Wolf and Narwhal is on right now, playing Valheim, which manufactured consent trust me I'm lying <laughs> it's still thinking about it god there's not that much to go through guys come on the little guys in the computer looking for the book Well, let's see. It's definitely available. I might be able to... Ooh. Since it's that old, I should be able to just download it for free. Might even look on, um, like, Project Gutenberg for it. An inquiry into the nature and causes of the wealth of nations is how they have it titled on Project Gutenberg. Also known as Wealth of Nations. There we go. I can download it for free. I'll do that right now. Um, and then we can get on to it. But I have already decided. Yeah, Thomas Soul is 93. He's He is up there. And that's too bad. He would have been um, would have been interesting to see him run the country for a while. But anyway, um, that'll be that. Um, I, I I guess I'll go ahead and go over to uh, Wolf and Narwhal. I have no interest in Valheim. Sorry, I don't. But um, I'll go ahead and take us on over there and um, give him a few minutes of our time. So I thank you all for coming in and listening to me butcher a book and um, hope you come back for listening to me butcher some more books. And I will see you over at uh, Wolf and Narwhal.